The Monerotopia guest segment is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. All right, so, on chain gaming special guest body, take it away. Um, yeah, so one thing you, you probably already figured out is that um, when you get those donations, especially those very public donations, um, you can flip that into Monero and then you know spend at least a few days on Monero. Um, typically, what you're better off is like you're, you're better off like getting a nice big fat stack of Monero um, and then you sort of top that up and then at irregular intervals, flip that back into Ethereum or whatever other chain that you're wanting to to use for um, for trading purposes. But yeah, if you just take those, like you've noted, if you just take those donations that you get on Ethereum and then you start trading them, everyone's like following your movements and, and tracking all your trades. Whereas if you say, you know, hey, I'm just going to put this into Monero, um, you know, and then periodically at irregular intervals. And the reason is that so it's that Monero has very strong privacy, but the one place where it's weak is when you go from one exchange directly to another exchange. And so even if you're using an instant swap service, you're still like you're still looking at that same problem. Where you're you effectively have to you have to assume that both of those entities are compromised and trying to conduct chain surveillance. So if you go straight from Ethereum into Monero and then you wait a couple of days and then you go from Monero back into Ethereum with the full amount, that's going to be trivial for them to tie those two things together. So um, maybe you've already you know figured figured this out, but your your best bet is just like kind of dumping dumping those donations into Monero and then at like some random time for some irregular amount flip that back into Ethereum so that you can start trading that without, at least without all of your, um, your followers knowing um, what, what moves you're making there. Yeah. The, so the thing about uh, crypto gaming is that a lot of the, the stuff that I talk about, it's like, it, because NFTs are unique. If people know that I own something, it's like, it's, I've given up on, on any sort of privacy, like, like around that. Um, so I, I I totally get what you're saying though, and, and yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, I've I've kind of just I've given up on on privacy on on Ethereum and Bitcoin. It's like I can have some pseudo anonymity, but if I want to talk about anything that that I'm that I'm owning or any games, um, and I like show a screenshot of like my in-game uh, like. Uh, like items and stuff. It's like anyone can easily then figure out what my wallet is and, and track and track everything. So that's that just that's just what NFTs are about. And um, let me let me just like kind of broaden out a bit. Um, going going back to I, I mean, unless you had something else that you wanted to throw in there first, uh, body. I would have just uh, suggested that you could potentially have two separate wallets. So one of them would be like your publicly facing Ethereum wallet, where You've got your NFTs. Everyone can see it. You're like, yeah, here's what's going on. And then you could have sort of your private wallet where you're making your own private trades on the side that um, that other people don't have to know about. Yeah, I, yeah, that's that's totally fair. But it's like <laughs> there's so uh, w one game that I was like really in interested in and and investing a lot in was uh, was Mirandis. Um, and a couple of the the NFTs that I owned for that game were like six figure NFTs. And it's impossible. It, like it's literally impossible to do anything with something like that without without making without making waves. And honestly, some of those are like rare enough that I think even if it was private, like I don't know, I don't really know if, if NFTs and privacy really work together that well. So so broadening out, like I was gonna say, um, the the realization I watched. Um, oh, I think it was Dr. Kim has like a lot of, I'm sure you guys have, have seen like all of his presentations. And I went through and watched all of his presentations after the Snowden uh, speech at this last Bitcoin conference. And I just like couldn't, I couldn't even believe how naive that I was about even the fungibility or perceived fungibility of, of Bitcoin and, and realizing that essentially like every single Bitcoin, because it has the transaction history is almost like an NFT as well. It just, it just really kind of blew my mind. And, and like the cards just really all started to fall at once around Bitcoin. And now all of a sudden, like these, these Bitcoin maxis that literally three or four months ago, I was like, yeah, <laughs> like agreeing with them. I'm like, oh my gosh, you you have no idea. And it, it feels like I was in the dark and, and now, now I see the light. And 
yeah, yeah it's, the, it's, it was pretty crazy realization the, the cult of personality around that stuff is it's the hardest thing to see because there are a lot of people leading the sheep to the slaughter and they're convinced that they're leading them to the promised land and you know a lot of us who have seen that for quite some time and I've been fortunate enough to be so paranoid that I pretty much just believe nothing until it's proven to be true. But like a lot of these people, they're completely convinced that the whole Bitcoin number go up thing is like the only retirement plan they need. And at a time in their life where this is like the most important time for them to be building their wealth and building their, you know, whether it be like their home equity or what. They, they are literally being convinced to put everything they have except for the ramen that they eat every morning or whatever into Bitcoin as like a retirement strategy. And, and that is that's the thing that freaks me out the most about this, because there are people who are like goading this on. But if you do that in any other place as a financial influencer, you know, that's like supposedly the biggest no, no, you know, that's one of the reasons why everybody says at the beginning of their YouTube finance thing, like, this is not financial advice for education purposes only or whatever. Well, you're not seeing any of that out of like the Bitcoin maxi Twitter crowd. It's just like, they, how dare you eat today when you could have bought more sats, bro, stack sats, stack sat, And like, in, in, this is like the path to ruin for some of these more impressionable young people, right? Who are, are literally putting everything that they possibly can into stacking sats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally, I totally agree with you. And it's not like, I, like, I don't think now, oh, Bitcoin's going to go to zero, but I do think that there's a lot of very disingenuous narratives around Bitcoin that are entirely false. And it's like Bitcoin can serve some some purpose in in the future but it's not going to serve all of the purposes that everyone currently thinks that it's going to serve and then the other thing is there seems to be this this like very strong almost religious like belief that simply because bitcoin was the first it is always going to be the biggest when as it's like i I'm, i invest in tech companies and that is repeatedly not true like the first is actually almost never the biggest because it does pave the way but then in what ends up happening is the the first mover gets complacent and innovators look at what the first mover did think about ways to improve on that technology and over and over again, you see the second, you see the third movers just absolutely taking up all of the market share. I mean, just look like Palm Pilot to iPhone. It's like people were saying, oh, the iPhone like doesn't have a keyboard. Like it's it, it's not going to succeed. It, it completely destroys the entire market. Or like you have MySpace and Facebook. It's like, oh, MySpace was first. It's, it's obviously going to stay the biggest. It's like, no, it, it got absolutely destroyed and no one's even heard that term in, in years and years. And I mean, Yahoo, Google, like you just over and over and over again, there's countless examples of the first mover doing something really cool and showing that something is possible and then being unwilling to innovate afterwards. I mean, uh, another example, uh, uh, Blockbuster made a big innovation on, on allowing you to watch a ton of movies and films without having to buy it. And after they have that success, you have the you have the innovators dilemma where you don't want to innovate because if you do, you're afraid of losing the current market or the, the current product that, that you're selling. You don't want to potentially stop being able to sell that thing. So an innovation feels like a threat. Uh, you, you saw this uh, with film as well. I think uh, who was the, I think was it was uh, I don't remember the 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 company but they literally invented digital digital uh cameras first and then never released oh, yeah. it because they didn't kodak. want to destroy their their yeah kodak because they didn't want to destroy their current business so i am seeing the exact same thing it is literally the exact same thing in bitcoin where the the number of updates are so smart that the sparse the innovation is really non-existent and and People right now, while the religious fervor is very strong, are claiming that this is what makes Bitcoin great, that it never changes. And it's like 
No, like if you look through history, every single technology that stopped innovating died away. And just like I, I, I went, I've gone through now and listened to like 10 different Snowden interviews. I went and listened to a bunch of McAfee interviews. Like I just ran, went down the rabbit hole. And like Snowden talked about how he has literally argued with, with, with Bitcoin developers for a decade trying to get them to implement privacy. And then he realized they're never going to do it because they're afraid that if they actually put privacy into Bitcoin, then all of a sudden regulators, all of a sudden politicians are going to stop favoring them, are going to stop, uh, you know, agreeing to join in for this for this whole like mooning uh, campaign. And it's because the government wants to be able to track everything. So I think that the 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 really smart people who are a part of Bitcoin actually know that like privacy is never going to be a part of it and they're willing to to sacrifice that in order to stay in the good graces of the powers that be uh, if that makes sense well we know that we know that bitcoin and privacy aren't two things that go together look at uh the recent things with samurai and all these issues just thing after thing after thing going after bitcoin's privacy uh tornado cash on ethereum all these things that are just really, really bad. And it's like you you cannot survive without default privacy. Yeah. I so I also I I feel like right now is a is a, a good time to be getting into Monero because we are in a well, two things. I think we're in a negative sentiment period for Monero just because of the delistings, delistings that have happened. The fact that it's a little bit harder to get to means that there's like a lot of, of average people that are just not going to do any of the extra work needed to buy it, um, which means that the price is probably a little bit more suppressed than it would be besides that. And I, I feel like the it also means that there's like positive catalysts ahead because like eventually once the government really stops cracking down, maybe we get a new administration or or maybe uh, just the Democratic Party just becomes more pro-Bitcoin because they don't want to lose votes. All that political nonsense is going to be what it is. But I think there's a very good chance in the future that we that we get, do get some relistings or we see like a Coinbase uh, listing, listing Monero, which is just a positive catalyst in the future. Uh, but then the second thing that's going on right now is we are just seeing how ridiculous governments can be. I mean, you just see what's going on uh, in Britain right now and how British citizens are just being like absolutely, I don't know if abused is the right word, but treated differently. And you, I mean, obviously all of you guys are aware of like what happened a while ago in, in Canada with like the freezing of the trucker bank accounts, but the, the amount of unrest globally, this like geopolitical tension, I think is also opening up people's eyes to the fact that, hey, this, this kind of joke, like, oh, what do you need Monero for? O only criminals need it, is, is going to just really become more and more foolish as the things that people view as normal, the things that people view as, as being something that should be accepted, all of a sudden become non-normative. All of a sudden, things that, that, you were like, like, I, I like personally, like, why do, like, why do I need privacy? It's like, well, because the things that right now you think are fine, the government is never going to have a problem with, they're going to become crimes in the future. And it's like, I, I don't know if, if any of you guys are, are religious at all, but if you look at like the book of revelation, it's like, even being a Christian is going to stop you from being able to buy and sell in the future. And even if, even if you don't put any credence in, in, in the Bible at all, it's very easy to see that like over time governments rise and fall and they become more and less totalitarian. And there are going to be periods of time where, just donating to the wrong political party can can get you put in jail. Um, if I mean, if if in Britain posting a meme can get you put in jail, it's like buying from someone who has been blacklisted. It doesn't matter if 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 uh, they're your friend and you're just trying to help their small business. It's like you get connected to that, and and now you are a target as well. It's just like privacy is very important. I mean, you like. This is a very, very simple, like small scale example. 
But just seeing how much more like conservative leaning posts on X have been getting likes, like the number of likes have been increasing so much after they made likes private. Because all of a sudden now you're not thinking about, oh, who's who's going to look at this and and dislike me because I, my viewpoint is is non-normative or like I'm going to get canceled if I like this post. That fear goes away and all of a sudden like you just saw the number of likes on 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 a certain side of the spectrum that's afraid of, of being canceled just increase. So yeah, it's it's just it's really really important and I think more and more people are going to realize that over time. Yeah, I had uh, maybe not totally off topic, but I had a, a question regarding um, Ethereum versus Soul. So you do a lot of NFTs, you do a lot of meme coins, gaming kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Have you seen a big uh, a big pivot from Ethereum to Soul? Is there like could Soul be stealing some of Ethereum's thunder? What are your what's your take overall on that situation? And of course, um, you know. It tied into that, do you see any um, any privacy solutions on Ethereum or Sol that uh, that are viable, or do you do you see anything that um, that could be up and coming? We had the tornado cash incident. What's your take on all that? Uh, so, Ethereum really does not work for gaming. Uh, at least at least the layer one doesn't. Uh, layer twos can. Um, it's just, it's way too expensive and way too slow. I mean, if you think about being in a, in a game environment, like a, like an MMO, if you're playing World of Warcraft, for example, and you want to trade something with, with another player and it takes several minutes for, for the block to go through, it's like that just slows down gameplay way too much uh, for it to work. And then the, the transaction fees on Ethereum are also just way too high. Um, and because of that, it's like, there's a lot of, of stuff that was built originally on Ethereum layer one that has either had to transition or stuff that's cheap just literally never moves because it's not worth buying or selling something for $5 if you're going to pay a two, three, four dollar sometimes during Ethereum, a $30 fee uh, for, for the transaction if, if volume is high enough. So I definitely think that layer layer one ethereum does not does not work for does not work for gaming um a lot of games have been transitioning uh to solana or a different or a different layer two on top of ethereum and that does seem to work quite a bit better um but like with solana you have to not really care that much about decentralization right but <laughs> I've I've taken a step back from the gaming space a bit. Uh, like I've been taking a, a like a several month break because I had an issue on on the in the gaming space where one organization that I was making a ton of positive videos about um, really started making a number of of really bad decisions. And I'm I'm going to be honest with my audience if I, if they're making a bad decision and that organization started getting really, really uh, frustrated at me because I, I turned from an ally to what I thought was still an ally providing constructive criticism, but they only wanted positive feedback, right? And then they literally froze earnings for assets that I had paid literally tens of thousands of dollars for. They decided I wasn't going to be able to earn in the game with those assets anymore because I became a critic. And it's like, this whole kind of vision that I had for for why crypto gaming, why on chain gaming was going to be amazing, like like a, a company can't take your asset from you. Well, it's like, does it matter if they blacklist the asset and then you can't use it in the game or you can't earn anything from it anymore? It's like literally the exact same thing. So I don't know what the solution is. Um, not even getting into the privacy, but just how do you even get? a decentralized gaming experience because you like building a game is expensive. You need a lot of money and you need a lot of developers if you're going to make something triple a. So I don't, I don't know. I don't think anyone has actually yet come up with a, with a good solution um, for that. Sorry. What was, what was the rest of your, what was the rest of your question? It was mostly about like the, are there any privacy solutions like in the works on those chains? Was what he was wondering if it, yeah, like that's, that's if there's right. any future privacy chain or privacy implementations on those chains well, that are two things. One, uh, yeah, what what do you see on the horizon? Are there is there anything like viable? And then kind of what's your take on um, on everything that happened with Tornado Cash, for example? 
Um, I don't know of anything yet that that has really any promise. Now, that does not mean that there's not anything, right? Like, I don't, I don't know everything that's going on in the space, but at least what has what I'm aware of, I don't, I don't think there's anything private in the in the crypto gaming space. I mean, everyone in crypto gaming cares about uh, mooning first and second fun gameplay and those problems have not even been solved like there's just really not even that many fun crypto games yet people aren't even thinking about privacy yet in, in the crypto gaming space so anyone who is working on privacy with like smart contracts or, or things like that they're they're in this community you guys know more about that um than i do they're not in the gaming community um and then as far as as far as tornado cash goes once again like you guys you guys are going to know more about that than me I have a thought for you that it's kind of interesting that you're on the stream right now because it's been rolling around in my head for quite some time. So uh, in when it comes to like phone games, they, you know, you always have some kind of in-game currency like diamonds or credits mm -hmm. or silver or whatever. And people actually value their stuff in the currency that they're, that they're using. Right. Yeah. But in places like you know Solana or Ethereum, like even the Ethereum themselves, they talk about the transactions in like dollar terminology. So they almost talk about even the stuff that they're doing in house as though it's an exit strategy for the dollar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that gaming is one of the places where i mean okay let's let's be honest a lot of people are trying to like play to earn games people wanted to like buy assets to play the game to make money to cash out um but there is going to be a moment where a a game lives on its own where people want to play it just because it's fun where it's also connected to the blockchain and in those in that ecosystem, and, and we've already, I've seen tastes of it. I've seen glimmers of it shining through the, the moon boys. There, there is that transition where, where people are, are talking about things in the term of that currency, like how much, how much this quest will earn in, in the in-game currency, what items I can buy in the game with that in-game currency. And the moment where people start caring about that world, start caring about that, their character, the power that they have, the, the stuff that they own in, in the world, you, you will start to see that transition, uh, that transition happen. But this, this is like, this is something that has to happen over a long period of time. I think we need to see more destabilization and some of these, uh, major government currencies. Um, when, if you, if, or, not if, when, I think you, you see something like a dollar collapse, it's, it's like, that's when it becomes open season, right? That's when all the paradigms fall apart and can be rebuilt. So until that happens, I think you are going to mostly see things still compared to the dollar. Uh, but there will be a time like the dollar Every single currency throughout history had, has had a limited lifespan. And there, there will be a time in the future when the dollar's time has, has ended. And I think there's a very good chance that a digital currency might take the place of, of a government-backed currency as what people denominate goods and services in and, and think about value uh, through the through the like prism of. Have you ever read... Have you ever read Ready Player One? Yeah, incredible. Yeah, I love that book. I love that book. And so many of the things you're talking about here are in that. So the government mm -hmm. uh, destabilized the currencies. And so the yep. the coin of the realm is the credit or whatever for ready for the game. And that's what people, the Oasis coin is what they use as currency because it's more stable than the dollar, the euro, mm -hmm. the yen, and all the global currencies. And the government's, are just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. And I think that book really shows what is possible in the future, um, even though it was written in, what, 2011? 
Yeah, no, I I think that that book is is originally what got me excited about about the on-chain gaming space. And when I realized that Ethereum could be, well, when I realized that Vitalik created Ethereum because of a World of Warcraft experience that he had, where I think one of his items got got nerfed or changed or something, and he got really mad. And he's like, "We need to all this needs to be on the blockchain," and that's why he created Ethereum. I was like, "Yeah, this this is incredible," but. What's interesting is that Ready Player One also shows one of the biggest issues that we still have not solved with 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 on-chain gaming yet, and that is that like the whole per the whole plot of the book is the Oasis is still centralized, and the power is going to be going to someone who is not trustworthy, and the the main character Parzival is trying to to win this quest in order to not let the 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 evil co corporation that that is also trying to beat the quest to to get ownership so that they don't take and ruin the oasis so the there this whole idea of centralization being a, a major flaw and weakness even in the super futuristic utopia of the of the oasis is something that we still need to figure out and i don't know i don't know what that solution is but on an oasis an oasis like experience with a digital currency that also figures out a way to decentralize itself perhaps after it's been made Maybe they open source it or, or something like that. I don't I don't know how it would work, um, but I do think that that would be such an exciting and and cool future. And a privacy coin is going to have a place in that future. What kinds of um, what kinds of native games like completely lives on the blockchain or completely lives uh, in a layer two? Like, are there any native games that are just completely decentralized, trustless? I know they can't be fully like. There's no way you could play. Um, I don't know, like a first person shooter or uh, or any of these like really involved games. You probably couldn't do that on the blockchain. But is there anything like Dungeons and Dragons that like versions of those games that live completely natively on some blockchain or on some layer two? Well, so I actually I do think that super fast paced games like a first person shooter uh, can exist on the blockchain because what you have to realize it's like not every single thing needs to take place on the blockchain like the the bullets don't need to register on the blockchain and the hitboxes like all all of that you can have decentralized servers or something like that um which I, there will there will be some issues with that compared to having a centralized server as well but only certain things, only transfers of value really need to be on chain. Like perhaps your 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 reward after you win a match uh, can, can happen on the blockchain or your skins. Like if you're thinking like CSGO, if all of CSGO's skins were just tokenized onto the blockchain, it's like that game would still work just as well. And people already buy and sell CSGO skins for real money. There's no reason you can't just tokenize those and CSGO would, would still work. The, the decentralization of the of the servers of the actual development that sort of thing is an issue another issue right now in crypto gaming is you have video game uh, creators trying to make uh, web3 games that know nothing about economics and have these like inflationary economies that just fall apart um or you have these uh like economists who are who are more on the money side of things who see web3 as an opportunity to make money and have never made a game before so there's there's really this issue as well as the decentralization issue but but i actually think it, it will be possible for for all sorts of games to exist on the blockchain because just the assets that matter in the games need to exist on the blockchain the game itself uh, can exist on on some sort of like decentralized server through through decentralized nodes or something like that. Um, as far as what exists right now, I don't think there is a single decentralized gaming project. To be honest, there's a lot of gaming projects. Like if you look at uh, Alluvium, for example, um, Alluvium does have a DAO um, and and a governance. Um, system in place and they do have a roadmap that does want to move toward decentralization uh but right now it's it's entirely a centralized thing i think it's like that's similar to solana right like solana wants to become more decentralized in time uh but right now it's still pretty pretty controlled uh, did that answer your question yeah 100 um i have a friend that has this idea of putting 
it's like Dungeons and Dragons or maybe something kind of like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, just putting that totally on the blockchain where you have different characters that like everyone can have their own unique character. Um, I don't know. You can get XP and you've got, you know, all of like, because it's a pretty simple, straightforward game, right? There's not a whole lot of data or information to keep track of. You could even do it something like where different characters can be partially owned by like an aggregate of people so that you could own part of a character and then be, um, be part of some voting mechanism to determine like the next action in the next game sequence that happens, something like that. I think he's developing it. Um, I'm not entirely uh, clear on the details, but it was something along those lines. Is that like, is there a demand for that out there? Or do people like, do people just not care enough about, <laughs> about that kind of thing to actually engage? So he, the, the issue is not that there's not demand for that or that it's not possible because it is and there is the issue is that that crypto games right now have to compete against these massive AAA studios so um as far as like card games goes there's like there's uh gods unchained um which is i mean it's 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 getting close to, to AAA quality but it's still just like just to be completely blatant not nearly as fun as um hearthstone for example that that blizzard made and until you actually have a Web3 game that is as fun, if not more fun, than the current most popular AAA games, the only people who are going to play it are people who want to make money from it. Because like, if you're just playing it in order to have fun, it's like you're just going to play the, the AAA games that are out there because you can have a lot of fun playing them. So you're currently sacrificing enjoyment in order to play something that's on the blockchain. Um, and, and like a lot of, a lot of what I try and do on on-chain gaming is, is like hype up these projects and like talk about like how, how cool it is that you have ownership on them and that I'm playing them and like trying to make them look as fun as possible, but it's an uphill battle, right? Because these studios are smaller than the AAA studios, the, the quality of the animations, the quality of the gameplay, it's just not as high as the AAA studios and you end up only retaining the users that are hoping they can get something out of the game. Um, and they might still play other games when they want, when they want to have fun. Right. So until that switches and you have part of the audience that literally just wants to have fun in the game, the ecosystems eventually just dry up because people are trying to take out of the ecosystem. Uh, and people aren't, continuing to put into the ecosystem just because they love the game. They love the world. They, they embody the character that's in the game and just want them to continue getting more powerful. It's like, that is when you're going to start having a thriving world, like ready player one. Facebook metaverse. They've, they've poured so much money into this <laughs> thing and it's a complete and utter failure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I actually have, I never, I, I, I haven't played it, um, but I, I saw screenshots and I think that that was enough for most people to decide not to play it. Uh, but it has, I mean, it's like, if, if you care about decentralization, if you care about privacy, um, nothing that meta does should, should have any interest to you. Are you seeing any activity happening on some of the private uh, smart contracts platforms? Have you seen anything gaming wise? try to use darrow or not not that we're like advertising darrow by any means but have they tried to use any of these any of these platforms uh not not that i've seen at least none of the big projects have yeah, like privacy i said coins are a niche space then definitely privacy contracts platforms are, are even more niche yeah it is even it is even more niche and there's still just like major problems in the in the crypto gaming space that need to be overcome before people can even start thinking about the problem of privacy because it's like you, you you never like i have not heard i have not had a single comment on a single video asking about privacy or or anything like that none of the community is calling for that um in in the on-chain gaming space um i think most of the community is is not even aware uh, that it could be important. It's like people just want to actually own their stuff in a fun game. And we, we haven't even gotten to that point yet. I mean, like, we, 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 maybe that's a little bit too pessimistic. There are some, like, reasonably fun games now where you do own your stuff. But 
nothing that's broken out to the mainstream, nothing that a normal gamer, I mean, most normal, like crypto gaming is a niche space. So most gamers just leave hate comments on, on my on-chain gaming uh, videos if they like really only care about gameplay. Like they're a Grand Theft Auto player. They come look at look at a crypto game and they're like, oh, this is so dumb. No one's ever going to play this. Why are you wasting your time? Because they don't see the importance of actually owning your assets. They don't see the importance of, of a digital economy actually becoming a real economy. Um, but the potential is just so like, I can't lose my enthusiasm because the, the potential is so exciting. Like if you do have a massive multiplayer online game that has a real currency that everything in the game are, 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 are true assets that, that players actually own. It's like, essentially you've set up a brand new country and that country's currency is interchangeable with all other countries currencies and, and it can have its own governance and it can have its own, uh, citizens. And essentially you you we will get digital we, we will get digital countries in the future. But right now, the like the innovators dilemma that we were talking about with Bitcoin earlier on, it is so strong right now in the gaming space. Like the <laughs> game game companies are not gonna give up like selling a skin that there's an infinite number of that that a player doesn't actually own when it's like free money right now it's like league of legends is never going to tokenize their 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 character skins when they can sell a million of them that that players don't actually own it's like why do i want to innovate make this harder for myself and potentially miss out on revenue because i'm limiting the number of these skins that exist um, or something like that and then what the players the players are going to be able to resell to new players well then maybe they're not going to buy from our store it's like they're, they're going to buy from another player instead of us and then we're going to make less revenue and the, like the innovators dilemma is so massive right now um that there needs to be a, a like an incredible team that just breaks away starts from scratch and and, and makes this happen you know it would be hilarious is if something like Grand Theft Auto Moonbase, which doesn't exist, but hypothetically, let's let's suppose that something like Grand Theft Auto Moonbase comes around and there's this in-game currency that represents like the moon base and this entire infrastructure gets built out online. And then someday far in the future, let's just say 50 years from now, there actually like is a moon base. And then 100 years from now, like it's highly developed and that the in-game currency actually becomes the real currency of that new development. Like that would that would just be hilarious. I think what's I mean, really interesting about this is if you think of it in reverse, which is people are clamoring for the right to own things. And a lot of them see the promise and the ability to actually own something in the digital space. But right here in the actual reality of the real world, uh, your, your rights to ownership are being further and further consolidated into the hands of like corporate and governing bodies, right? Where everything is becoming a subscription model and everything is like, for example, uh, titles, right? Like in China or Vietnam or all of these places, like you can't even actually have a, a, a title that means anything to the property where you build your house. Like the government claims that you have a maximum of 99 years before it's theirs again. And so you can't even like pass down an inheritance in most countries of real stuff. And the same arguments that are made for like, for example, physical possession of gold, they also apply to like dead software projects but then if you look like anywhere where uh, the code base for a popular game has been taken, like a command and conquer red alert, and people are keeping it alive, the fact that you can have the software that you can continue to use and play it, and then your children can play the game that you played as a child and so on. But then you go back into the world right now where it's like, you can't buy a car and then pass it on to your kids and fix it anymore. Right, like, and you will own nothing, and you will be happy. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It is definitely unfortunate the the kind of trend um, that seems to be taking place in the world. And what's what's almost more sad than the fact that like those in power want to more power because like okay that makes sense. What's even sadder than that is is how kind of unwilling 
normal people seems to seem to be to speak out against it. Um, like even like so much, like I think the Monero community is actually a lot bigger than it appears because so many people who are attracted to the Monero community care about privacy, right? And, and care about uh, not standing out, of not being visible, of not being in the in the limelight. And I think because of because of this almost f fear of of standing out, of standing up against powers, which which I mean, it's a reasonable fear, right? Because those in power have a have a lot more control. Have a, I mean, they have more power than than those who who are just like normal. And 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 don't think they can make a difference. But the the honest truth is that it's like the silent majority is the majority, and those in power only have the power because we we like allow them to have the power. But we're in this age where it's just like so easy to be distracted. It's like you can distract yourself for for years and years and not even come out of that like cloud and like I've, I've been in it especially with like weed and, and alcohol and and uh like pornography it's like you can, like i can just get trapped for years and and come out of the trance and and be like well what happened to that time like i've been i've been wasting my life what's happening in the world around us like so many people just like you, like you can just lose sight of what's actually happening but I, on a, on a positive note, I think that because of of kind of the the, the type of person the Monero community attracts, I think the, the reason I picked this image, I think it's a lot stronger than people realize. I think that the base that's here um, is is very exciting. Like people like like Douglas and and like the the Monero. Like I, as I've been learning about this space, I'm like, wow, there's a lot more going on than I realized. The fact that you guys are attracting some of the early like earliest Bitcoin uh, developers and 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 they are they are supporting Monero. They're realizing that th that this is the future. It's like the longer the base, the the deeper the base, the bigger the eventual breakout will become, and. It's like I'm excited now. Like I'm, I'm probably gonna start making some some Monero focused videos on my channel. A lot of my audience won't like it, but who cares? It's like I think this is really important. And like I said, the 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 transition will be slow at first. There's just a couple people break away from the Bitcoin maxi community or the the Ethereum maxi community, but after like those early adopters are followed are followed by um, by the by the majority of adopters later on. And when more people who who care about privacy for privacy's sake, who have nothing to hide, nothing to fear, um, actually start standing up, like there will be a, a moment where it can no longer be stopped. Um, I, I, I have a question for you guys. Do you know what happened to Dr. Kim? Like, how come he hasn't made any more content for like two or three years? I've been wondering the same thing. I mean, he pretty much said his piece, though, right? Like, then be honest, the, everything that he needed to say has been said. You know, either people listen or they won't. I'd point that out. Like, everything in those videos is, you know, 10 times as true now as it was two years ago, three years ago. Everything, everything you said kind of made me just cry tears of joy to hear somebody who's not a part of the normal community the normal privacy hub say that they are going to do these things, whether their audience or whatever likes it or not like that, I think sends a really powerful message. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I think I'll, I don't think I like, I'm going to, I'm going to be one of the smallest and, and I think I'm, I'm early on this as well, but you listen to people like, uh, like uh, Tucker, uh, the, the ex Fox news broadcaster, um, there was some some post on X that went kind of uh, viral recently, where he's talking about the importance of privacy, or even uh, like Ron Paul, um, who who right now he thinks he thinks Bitcoin is something that it's not because he's not technical at all, right? He has he has these these views of libertarianism which are very foundational and powerful, but he doesn't have the technical savvy to to really realize Bitcoin isn't all that that he's hoping that it's going to be. But after the, like this, this narrative, it's, it's like a, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to, I was going to say 
virus, but that's not, I, I, there used to be a, what's a, what's a better word for it. But after, after it like gets into the contents, after you've, you've heard it, after you've realized it, it starts to gnaw away inside and you start to realize wait, this, this is actually, this is actually important. And once the cat's out of the bag, it's like, you can't put it back in. And I think that that is something that, that Snowden has been trying to push for. And, um, like I said, on, on X, I've seen a couple Bitcoiners already break away. Um, I'm, I'm an Ethereum guy who's who's starting to, to realize the importance of, of privacy. And it's it's slow. And it like it could still be a couple years of slow moving. But things that are true, things that are fundamentally important, are, they're not going to die away. On chain gaming. Hello, hello. Um... How, how do you see the, um, the type of transactions? Let's say I believe that uh, Monero should make um, transactions like to buy a coffee. That would be like the base use case. Everyone should be able to do that, you know. And you brought up an interesting point that if like uh, you don't need to keep track of all the bullets flying when, when you're playing right on the chain. Mm -hmm. But... Um, do you see it as well like that? Or do you think that uh, on-chain gaming because of the, um, or just because it's merely digital and virtual on the that world, that it should have the, uh, even another type of transaction like um, more than the base? I, I hope I explained myself well. Um. So for, uh, regarding the coffee thing, you're, you're totally right. And um, I've been checking out some of the, some of the marketplaces. And I think that that as a as an influencer, one of the ways that I can help support the Monero community is just sharing so that more people understand the number of things that you can buy with Monero. And we've already seen this um, with with Axie Infinity. Um, in the Philippines, when it was really blowing up before people realized that it was an inflationary economy and everything kind of crashed, there was literally a six month period where you started to see the majority of grocery stores, coffee houses, things like that in the Philippines start accepting SLP, um, which was a currency that you earned playing the Axie Infinity game. Unfortunately, that experiment fell apart. But it just goes to show that the business owners will accept the payment that their customers want to use. Like if enough people start wanting to pay in something, business owners will start to will start to accept it. I think one of the problems right now is that people don't people are not understanding there's not enough pain that's forcing people to understand why they should really care about privacy. And this, this might be a little bit nihilistic, but I think that if things like governments continue to degrade um, and, and they start to become more irrational, they start to infringe on freedom more, this is going to wake more and more people up. And overall, it might have a positive impact because when the pain of, of not changing becomes greater than the pain and, and uncomfortability of moving to something new, it's like when that scale adjusts, that is when you start to see this, this mass migration. But right now, it's just not that painful to use the US dollar to buy a coffee. Um, even even with 20% inflation, like people complain a lot, but but people still think, oh, they're going to fix it. It'll be okay. Um, but eventually, like <laughs> we have some mounting issues like the national debt where at, at some point and, and countries moving away from the dollar at some point, it is going to become very painful to use um, government backed currencies and in countries that have even less stable currencies uh, than the U.S. than the U.S. has with the U.S. dollar. You've seen actually quicker transitions to to digital assets. So. I think it's important that more people that have influence, or even if you don't have influence, but but you you think you have an ability to communicate, 
start sharing things like Monero, it will make sure that that it that when the transition inevitably does come in the future, Monero will, will be viewed as one of the prime candidates to to be that money of of the future. Because like right now, it's it's still it's still up in the open, right? Like most people have no idea; they haven't heard about Monero yet. Um, and I, I do uh, think well, that the community is the base my, is there, but uh, it's my humble opinion that uh, Monero has not reached a uh, censorship resistant level of hash rate, which uh, for me is the most, uh, the primary objective. And uh, I think that adoption should uh, firstly be on the mining side uh, because like there is this uh, catch 22 people say, what comes first, the price or the hash rate? No, first you turn on your machine, you make the hash rate, then comes the price. As stupid as that, but um so do you do you think that uh, what do you think about that of the censorship resistance of uh, monero um so as far as hash rate goes right monero has a little bit of a lower hash rate because of the fact that you mine it with with cpu gpu right instead of asic um so that inherently i think will keep the the hash rate a little bit lower um if if i understand things right uh, but it also means that that the hash rate doesn't need like you need to set up a lot of CPUs in order to meet that hash rate, right? So I agree that the hash we need we need to like I will I will I will make some tutorials about how to mine. Um, I need to, I need to keep learning more myself so that I can explain everything accurately. But being a little bit of a novice to this space is actually a bit of an advantage uh, because since I since I don't understand. Uh, things on on a, on the same amount of like a technical depth as a developer. Um, I think people that are even less technical See, than that, me can understand my to, tutorials. To to be uh, uh, humble as 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 you are explaining now, because it's funny. A lot, lot of Bitcoiners, lot of uh, this moon uh, philosophy is out there. Uh, they all pretend to be uh, computer experts, you know, and we all have limitations in our understanding of the logic of these things. And it's important to recognize that uh, Monero has its own uh, way of uh, widening this network. Uh, it was uh, it works uh, differently. In 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 the case of if you want to make an attack, you probably will, will notice it's not so easy because. Uh, you need to see things happening in the in the network, in the network. Excuse me, and and you need uh, to operate in different uh, manner as as you do with uh, Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, for example. So that's very very simple things that people don't think about. Just people just uh, logging into Binance and uh, one day free money, and that's uh, that uh, philosophy for me. That's uh, why I uh, people like me say. Oh, Maybe you have a big uh, price, but you are dead. So that's uh, very important. And uh, thank you, guys. Uh, I have a a question for Body and Tux specifically. I know we we'll probably have at least something to say about this, but um, very recently, some information about the new Ryzen processors has come out, and a lot of the people reviewing it are reviewing it for their own reasons, right? So like gaming channels reviewing them for gaming and all that. But what I've noticed is the power efficiency of this new generation of Ryzen processors. I can see a, a very interesting use case for Monero on these new Ryzen processors. Has Dude, anybody I know it's crazy. That? I've almost bought one to try like mining with it to see now we don't have the new ryzen nines yet the newest one that you can actually buy right now is the that's why i haven't tried the ryzen 7 like, x this but might be epic right like, it's pretty good efficiency um really really good efficiency and, and the hash easy, rate easy, that easy. one processor can crank out too it's like both efficient and like think about the hash rate it'll probably get yeah, I mean, so I definitely want to wait to see what the new Ryzen nines will do, because um, I've been I've actually been looking at buying a little bit new hardware recently, so I've been doing a bunch of research on this stuff. Um, but yeah, the the new 
Zen 5, it, it goes from a like 7 nanometer to a 5 nanometer node process, so it gets a bit more efficient. Uh, but also, the multi-core performance goes up quite a lot, too. Now, the Ryzen 7 still has an 8-core, 16-thread part, um, so I do want to see what the Ryzen 9s will be able to bring out. But yeah, historically, AMD Ryzen's have been the best for running Monero, so I, I am also very curious to see LS get on what the efficiency plus hash rate would be on some of the new Ryzen's coming out. Anyway, I think I was a side step. I don't but. know if you saw that new office that I built and all that. I'm getting like it, getting it all wired out for, um, for basically being like a little server hub for Heat and Chloe's house. <laughs> but, um, it, like my thoughts about that now is like if if the Ryzen nine is anything, or I mean, I, I wonder if you know just like you, you had you like 5950 x's or, or whatever the 50x version of the ryzen 9 is going to be uh because you get to that level and they basically design them like servers you know or i wonder like what the epic technology is going to run like with that um because i was really starting to think about the whole like pivot to arm just generally um but I, d I don't know, there might still be some juice to squeeze when it comes to the data centers and like x86 stuff. And it's, you know, it, and I feel like a, that that whole thing, like people just missed the shit out of it. Like they, they did not, or at least where I'm looking, like when I look at the actual numbers, the same people are like, ah, oh, this is not a worthwhile buy. And I'm like, but look at that performance efficiency. Like if, you know, it like, outside of your little bubble like that's actually really interesting you know yeah there's there's definitely caveats there um in terms of getting more cpu cores at the moment i would say your average normie doesn't have any more need of additional cpu cores above let's just say like 8 to 12. 8 to 12 is, is going to meet all of your needs everything that you want to do it's going to keep you running parallel processes you know so you're you're live streaming or you're, you're playing um, you're playing a video for your kids in the next room at the same time that you're um, you know, you've got like 50 tabs open on your browser, stuff like that. Um, so for most people, you really don't need that many more cores. Um, who knows what kinds of things simultaneous uh, multi-threading is going to do for you, right? SMT. Um, you know, there, there, there has been kind of this lag where, where there's been extra processor cores available, but programs haven't really been written they're, they're catching up, but um, there was really this big lag for programs being written to be able to take advantage of that simultaneous processing. At the same time, if you're someone that does need some kind of small home server, right? Like, so for example, maybe you've got a ranch out there and then you, you want to set up a series of cameras to monitor everything that's going on. Um, and then you want like highlights when there's certain types of movement that it detects, right? Like you're going to need to dedicate a few processor cores just for that. Um, obviously, you know, you're going to want to mine some Monero um and then nice. hypothetically if if the network grows like it could be the case that that just to run a node you need you basically need a processor core running all the time just to keep up um with all the transactions you know we would be looking at millions of transactions a day if that were the case but you know hypothetically it could be the case that you need an entire core or maybe two cores just to verify all the transactions um you if know, you were running a full node body on that on that level and while we have on-chain gaming on here so uh, there, there's this MMO out there. It's called Ashes of Creation, and I've been really obsessed with it because there's certain elements of the open source software community that are philosophically built into this game. So it is a proprietary software game, and it is, you know, it's a for-profit company developing it or whatever. But they actually have this open development ethos. So as they're building and developing the game, they are including the 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 people who intend to play it into the development of the game and they're actually like changing their development philosophies and stuff based on you know what the people in the in the you know in the core audience let's call it are suggesting which i find fascinating because i'm a strong believer that basically like the banking cartels have taken over nerd culture and they've taken and it, it, it it's kind of the same fight in in a cultural sense right where you know, I used to be a comic book nerd, or if you've looked at D&D 4th &D edition and 5th edition, I'm, I'm quite the D&D &D connoisseur, right? Like, it went from, you know, very, uh, like, Lord of the Ringsy. like, it, it was about the lore, it was about the fantasy, 
fantasy, excuse me, to it was about like woke culture and like not hurting feelings and stuff. And you could just see like the never ending infiltration in our culture and ashes of creation took like this totally different approach to all of it. Right. Like it went way back into like old school pathfinder, like a, um, it, well, the reason why I bring all of that up and how this ties into uh, processing and threads and all of that is the way that servers have been hosted forever, right? That the, the most the most impressive leap forward in having like lots of servers, but also having each server have lots of players that can interact with each other simultaneously. So World of Warcraft had come up with all of this really cool technology to be able to have a lot of players in one location interacting with each other. And then they started building like layers and like server sharding and all of that. And then development in that area basically died, right? Like just nobody was coming up with anything. Well, there's this total like vaporware scam game depending on how you look at it i i think it's called like uh it, it's like the space mmo i forget what it's called but um they had made after like i think it was like 10 or 20 million dollars in development they had designed like kind of this idea for how they were going to make it easier to have even more players in one area interacting with each other well ashes of creation about three months ago, I think it was, they released some of the some of the infrastructure behind how they did servers. And with this tiny little budget, they had managed to incorporate multiple threads into running a server at the same time in a way that nobody else had ever done. And the reason why I bring that up is, you know, there, there's uh, like uh, these major soft or hardware architecture people like they'll come up with these great ideas but then the software people don't know how to use them i mean it's especially true in things like quantum computing right like who's writing software for quantum computers right now like basically no one it's always a hobby project it's only profitable if you're in somebody's r d at some major corporation and that that technology is going to go in a black box to die right but meanwhile in the enthusiast in gaming space and in the crypto space, people are taking all of these incredible architectural possibilities like multi-thread. Or remember when we covered the uh, using existing internet infrastructure, somebody had like, you know, a thousand folded bandwidth with, you know, just like a home-based research project. This guy had figured out how to improve bandwidth with existing networking technology, right? That was fiber optic. Ahead, they, they figured out how to pump uh, a tera a terabit per second over existing fiber optic. You have to upgrade the modem infrastructure, but um, but the existing fiber optic infrastructure apparently can support it. I think that was like a Japanese research project, and that was very recent. Yeah, and and one of the things that I um, all of these things tie together, right? And oh, by the way, on chain gaming, I appreciate that you came onto the show with all of us. We, the reason we do this show is for stories like yours. And I appreciate you sharing your story. The reason why all of us come here every single week, week after week, is we are hoping that people such as yourself an entrepreneur and others will will come on and you know share your stories and all that so thank you by the way very much but uh what one of the things about the way that th these the hardware and the in the uh like processor infrastructure it's usually the enthusiast space like gaming like you know or for example like financial trading and stuff like uh think of all how front running algorithms led to what today we use for predictive and you know learning um advanced learning ai and stuff like that like predicting stock markets and predicting you know momentum trades and all of that is what built like a large section of the you know the the modern feedback loops of uh large language models and so on and that was back in like, must have been like 2000. And so a lot of people probably can't appreciate just how important people trying to figure out how to be able to trade an item on a, on a clunky blockchain like Ethereum 
will probably event eventually be like a a, a magic is like the secret sauce for something like dark fi to be able to you know send like some smart contract that could lead to some revolutionary technology or whatever um the, these these forward progress the, these things usually come from the hobby and enthusiast space hey can i break in a second to ask uh, is tari relevant on cherry chain gaming also it might be a good time to get uh, fluffy on for an update on that I also would love an update on Tari. Uh, I'm not. I'm not that familiar uh, with Tari, but I just want to take a step back and and make a comment about what you were saying, um, Alaskan. On it can oftentimes feel very slow and sloggy when you're in the middle of a of a revolution, um, like Monero or honestly all of these converging revolutions that, that seem to be happening all at once. Um, it, it can feel slow, but it's only because we're in the middle of it. When you, when you take a step back and when you look at what happened over a decade or several decades, it can take your breath away. So I think another one that's happening right now is like autonomous vehicles with Tesla. And I, I, I test, uh, I, I have a full self driving in my Tesla and, and it's been like two or three years of just like very slow progress. And it can feel like it, nothing is happening. Like, is it actually getting better? Like, is, is this actually going to be the future? But then you take a step back and you look over three years at how much more the car can do now than it could do three years ago. And you realize like, wait, this progress is actually blistering. Like in the, in the course of history, in the context of history, this is insanely fast. So as far as as far as the Monero community goes, it might feel like stories like mine are are sparse, are, are are far and few between. But I want to encourage you guys, like like continuing to show up every single week and and and, and do this and just be here and make sure that that there is somewhere where people can learn if they are interested. Like it it does make a difference. And you oftentimes probably don't know when you might be converting someone or or or, or bringing someone into the Monero community uh, because they 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 might not make a comment. They might not pop on and and, and chat. Um, but I think that that over time, when you guys look back a decade from now, you are going to be absolutely blown away by the by the difference that that channels like Monero Talk uh, made on not only the crypto gaming space but the entire world and the importance that this currency might have in, in different futures that that might come about. It's it's going to be far more impactful than you guys realize when people are able to eat because they can buy or sell something with a with a private currency. Um, and, and that's literally the difference between being able to feed their family or not. Um, I'm Jane, are, have you heard about Monerotopia yet? Like the conference? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, uh, I've, well, I've heard it mentioned there, right? a couple of times. Like, um, it's, it's in, uh, Mexico, right? Mexico, Mexico city. city right? Roma. Um, what, what's the date? I think the, the issue is that I have a yeah, younger sister a who's getting married for a plug hint, hint, nudge, nudge, but I'll do my best right now. So there is a website, uh, Monerotopia.com 2024, and you will find all of the relevant information, including the ability to purchase your tickets now. Um, they are thousands and thousands of dollars less than the giant scam conferences like Bitcoin. Um, I mean, even the VIP tickets aren't even 250 if you're measuring it in U.S. fiat Fed notes, which I'm sure everybody is in a rapid hurry trying to part with as quickly as possible in order to uh, join us at the Monerotopia conference. But general admission is $89, a screaming deal. So buy seven, just in case your family wants to come. Um, I know I have more than what I really know what to do with. But anyway, <laughs> um, and then another thing. So uh, Slave Blocker had mentioned how important it is to add to the hash rate. But another element of why Monero is so powerful and secure is the way that nodes are done. They're very similar to what people are used to, but 
you know, it's it's the small differences that make nodes more interesting and effective in the Monero world. Well, this gentleman kind enough to slave away week after week to make sure Monerotopia goes on, Doug Tooman there, um, he uh, put together a project for something called the Monero Noto, and I'm sure his bank account is crying because of the idea. But <laughs> the, the, he's building a, uh, well, not him, but people who are building it that he's kind of not only financing out of pocket, but then on top of that, um, you know, selling it away day after day, there is something called the Monero Noto. And the idea behind it is it is supposed to be a plug and play, ultra super mega secure, easy to use node that just runs in the background. And you know how when you're using Monero, you'll have to like sync your wallet and all of that other stuff. Well, it brings the best of both worlds like a light wallet can be used at the level of security of you know a full wallet on a graphene phone as long as you're using a graphene phone which i certainly hope you're using a graphene phone homie but anyway um you'll be able to have a light wallet with all of the kind of security that you would get out of a proper wallet and i would assume that cake wallet is also working on having um like that level of interoperability where if you're hoping if you're hosting your own node you can connect to that node without having to wait to sync with the blockchain and all of that but these little advancements are in my opinion they're massive because i think one of the problems with normie adoption of like on-chain level one transactions in a proper private digital currency are things like syncing your wallet or are things like being able to use it in the secure and best possible way without having to learn, you know, astrophysical biology or whatever madness that is required for the average person to just buy a coffee. You know? um, but the last thing about having these conferences that I think does at least as much as having these shows is the the key mechanism for getting people to jump ship from one fiat to another right even though there are technically currencies that have never died right like gold or silver or so on like the amount of silver in a denarius from 2000 years ago is still the same amount of silver just generally speaking i mean i guess it's technically degraded a little bit um but the thing is is it's actually the utility in the alternative that causes them to jump ship. And I, for those of you who listen to the show a lot, I'm sorry to kind of be a broken record here, but let me give you an example real quick on chain. If you wanna make a transaction from here to let's say Venezuela or Iran or Russia, or even somewhere where it's legal like Mexico, there are endless hurdles for me to pay somebody in a foreign country. But with Monero, it is just as easy as paying my neighbor. Or another thing is, um, it, a lot of the gold community is just as bad as like a Bitcoin maxi at not seeing the reality right in front of their face, which is if I have gold and I'm in Alaska, which I am, and all of my gold was lost in a boating accident. Um, if I want to purchase avocados from Mexico, right? I can either send the gold to Mexico or they can send the avocados to me and hope they get paid. Or I can bring in a trusted third party or I could do like half down, half on delivery. All of these methods are less than ideal, right? But with the cryptocurrency, you can use things like multi-sig wallets or you can, you can peg them to a smart contract that needs to be fulfilled on or whatever. Now, the, the ease of use of that utility might have gone down a little bit, but business to business transactions are already more complicated than something like a multi-sig wallet. You're talking about like inter, international bonds. You're talking about, you know, putting a certain amount of capital up and getting the credit from a third party financial institution and all this other stuff, phone calls and emails and you know, wire transfers, and it's a nightmare. A multi-sig wallet is like mind-bogglingly easy compared to any of that stuff. 
And the thing is, is it's the utility of something like Monero combined with the reliability of its ability to deliver on the promises of the currency that make it so interesting for somebody who maybe the dollar hasn't collapsed yet. And you would still be interested in using Monero over using fiat, right? And what's really, really cool about that is so uh, for people like myself that, you know, the, the industries that we're in, right? Um, pay on delivery is almost dead, right? Like something being payable on delivery has basically evaporated. And, you know, most people don't even think about what it means anymore. However, when somebody signs for the receive for having received their goods and services, you could also make that the condition by which the multi-sig wallet releases the funds, right? So you could bring back pay, payment on delivery and reduce the overhead of, you know, your accounting team and invoicing and all of that other stuff. And then you can even have that go into its own wallet that, you know, you can put your own notes on it and all of that stuff. Your wallet could even keep track of for you. You know, it could privately take some kind of location data from where you are and use that as verification for the release of the funds is, in fact, this customer and so on. The, the utility of a, of a private digital cash is so mind-blowing if you're in the business space that I think we don't have to wait for fiat to collapse. In fact, the collapse of the fiat may be the utility of the crypto. And so putting all of these things together, I can't wait to see you in Mexico. I bet you will be the best of friends, or at least, you know, you can hate me and I'll think you're a great guy. And <laughs> I am excited to know that, you know, you'll be plugging in your Monero Noto shortly. <laughs> but I, what do you think about the utility argument is what so, I really like. So first of all, um, I will buy a ticket. I just checked and um, Monerotopia, it looks like is a week after my sister gets married. So there's no conflict there. Why so, is yeah, she not got... getting married in Mexico at Monerotopia? <laughs> Like I will donate to that, by the way. Mexico is a beautiful place that time of year. Roma is like the romance. Like it, it's I, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Uh, may, maybe I'll, I'll pitch it to her. <laughs> no, I, people have already bought tickets. Wedding. They already have yeah. a venue. It's, it's, it's Here's your honeymoon. Good. It's Monerotopia. <laughs> I got you and your husband and your future child and all that a ticket. And we'll see you there. <laughs> Yeah, I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll let my family know. Maybe maybe someone will wanna will wanna join me or one of my friends or something. Uh, but yeah, I, I will I'll try to I'll try to make it. I'll try to make it. Um, but regard regarding what you were talking about, um, I think it's so true. Um, you're you're right. It could be the adoption of, of something like Monero that that does lead to the collapse of of these of these currencies. Um, and it's possible that, that like the pain will increase slowly to use these things even before before they finally collapse these things regarding uh, government backed currencies um but i just want to talk for, for a second about about what you were saying with 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 like before the start, utility of, of gold yes gold before you start i will add only one thing uh referring to alas Kunun just said uh, imagine uh, if you can teleport or uh, instantly send physical gold from Alaska to Mexico, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, this is possible if you anonymous, uh, securely interchange being anonymous in the street, both of the, on the same time and on the same day with Monero. Why not? Internet and gold. So that's why I you got too far away from your microphone. Can you start over from? Uh, uh, yeah, because I have uh, also connection problems. But uh, it, uh, having this thing on 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 built with uh, internet interface, and at the same time supported by uh, Monero, Monero Nergor, I think that's a, a a a breakthrough in in gold and silver trade, because. If you have the ability in your home, sitting, uh, matching a, a um, how I would say, 
a trade in gold and silver in exchange of Monero locally in both these different places on the world. This is uh, this is good for Monero and good for precious metals. So I I, I don't 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 know uh, other because when you do this kind of activity, you need to be secure. You need to use Monero. So you are hiding from criminals in some way and also from some potential corrupt uh, uh, policemen in Mexico or whoever knows. But both parties have different interests and they don't know to um, accordingly uh, talk to each other to arrange all things. They just use Monero and if Monero uh, is used enough on, on this uh, on this type of transaction, I think it's both good for silver and gold. And uh, I don't know uh, why uh, some silver uh, community uh, expert just take like this guy on chain gaming and uh, talk about this, this possibility with Monero. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. Gold has a, gold has a lot of of shortcomings. I mean, uh, McAfee talks about how you can't go from one country to another country carrying a lot of gold because they'll confiscate it from you. Or, or like you're saying, you you can't just teleport physical gold from one location to another. Um, like you can send Monero over over the internet. So uh, that is one of the major limitations. And and Bitcoin people would agree with that, right? Like that's why they'll say that Bitcoin is superior because you can easily send from one country to another. Um, Whereas you, you can't do that with gold, but then Bitcoin has a shortcoming that gold is superior in, and that's the lack of privacy with Bitcoin. The fact that every single thing is on the public ledger and there's a, you can track it all, um, whereas gold gold has this massive privacy advantage still um, where you can have it and, and no one no one will, no one can know that you have it. Um, you can have it stored and, and it's completely anonymous. And um, Monero, solves both of these problems like it's the best of both worlds where you can send it from one country to another like bitcoin and it's private like gold and i just think that that's incredible it's like why why do i want to sacrifice one of these things when i can when i can have it all it's like monero is a no-brainer in, in that regard um and then i have one more thing uh, that i wanted to, to, to say about gold but tux you unmuted did you want to make a comment here Oh, no, you, you go ahead. You continue. Okay. So then the, the other thing that I don't think people are thinking about, um, but it's very interesting because I, I like thinking on, on grander scales, like hundreds of year time uh, frames. And we are getting to a point as human civilization where space travel is going to start getting drastically cheaper. I mean, it already is. Um, it hasn't gotten cheap enough yet to affect the av the average everyday person. But what's happened over this last decade is we've gone from a situation where every single time that a rocket went into space, it it like blew up and you like lost most of the value of building it to Elon with SpaceX making them reusable. And if you think about how expensive it would be to fly from one place to another, if every single time the plane crashed, it would be impossible, right? Like no one could afford to fly somewhere because you're paying the entire cost of building an airplane every time you want to do a single flight. And that is that's where that's where humans have been getting to space. So making rockets reusable is going to drastically make them cheaper, drastically make getting to space cheaper, which means stuff like mining asteroids becomes a reasonable thing or, or space manufacturing where potentially you can manufacture stuff in, in zero gravity, um, which could be a lot easier. Um, and this means that there is a lot of gold out there a lot of potential inflation out there. Once again, I'm, I'm thinking in hundreds of year time uh, scales where you see, you see like, asteroids that that get pictures taken of them and and like they get examined i don't know how accurate the examinations are but even if they're within like a, a several orders of magnitude it's like there's a lot of gold in some of these asteroids and and when it gets very cheap to go to space there are going to be companies mining companies that are set up to try and mine gold um on asteroids that are that are coming close close to earth or or even going out a little bit further and i know this is maybe not going to be that big of a deal even in our lifetime. But if you're thinking of like generational wealth, um, 
I think that there is going to be a lot more uh, gold inflation than people realize um, as humans reach expands uh, broader away from earth. And all of a sudden it's not about how much gold is on earth. It's about how much gold is within like a 10 or 15 year period, like away from us. And this is something you, that you will push people towards of, Monero as well. I can kind of poke a major hole in that. Thesis. Okay. Yeah, sure. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> it's, uh, um, okay. And, let's and, do that thought and then we'll try to, to wrap it up, but yeah, yeah. go ahead. So the thing is, is for one, you know, exploration in space, like, you know, under the assumption that it would be the possibility that I think people think it would be, which I don't even agree with that. But um, I mean, there is still an absolutely mind boggling amount of gold that's unmined on Earth. Right. That's true. And and one of the things is, is it's it's more about a price equilibrium. Right. So the incentive to mine gold for even just the most basics of technology like for example if you could make single board computers using gold instead of copper the 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 performance and the heat and all of that would be just absolutely incredible it tarnishes less effectively um and but i mean and people do that with silver now and they don't even recover the silver from those circuit boards even though there's a considerable amount of silver people don't even recover the silver from solar panels hardly at all even though there's a lot of silver in the solar panels it's all about a price equilibrium but the thing is is if you think of things in terms of intergenerational wealth there's the general economist way of thinking of it which is how many more dollars they have than the next guy but then there's the real world situation which is how much goods services energy and so on do you personally have access to as a result of your inheritance so to give you an idea if the we'll just use the word gdp even though it's like a completely like fucked system of measuring anything right how many goods and services are produced in a given period, right? If you have a massive explosion in the productivity for some reason, and you have a massive explosion in the amount of energy available to you, well, then technically, if you were holding energy stocks or whatever, you might see some kind of price suppression measured in currencies. However, you have more access to energy than ever before, and you have more productivity than ever before. Even if your number go up, Bitcoin Maxi Ethos says, oh, my gains, bro, my gains. It's like your burger just got cut in half as far as price, right? Or what? So you can get twice as many burgers with your Bitcoin than you could yesterday. But it would look like you took a hit financially because most people can't think in terms of how much stuff can I buy with whatever currency I'm holding, right? And the thing is, is gold is so much more the case for that than basically anything else known to man, because the physical properties of gold and its rarity are fighting each other right now. Like almost every piece of dental work ever done would have been done in gold all throughout history if it was financially possible to do so. Almost every you know every conduit in every building would be gold if you had access to gold on that level gold would so quickly replace copper for like so many uses and you'd be right back to the situation where you need a larger supply of gold right if everybody was using gold and silver wiring in their house you know how much less energy would go to ground do you know how much less natural gas you would be using it would be absolutely mind-blowing right and it's always a cost benefit analysis well copper does a good enough job it's super cheap to get it's everywhere and so if gold was just everywhere i don't think you would see a price collapse of gold and the other thing is is the utility of money itself would go down so in other words you would not see this mind-blowing inflation that goes on if all of a sudden people had access to thousands and thousands of tons of gold that they didn't have access to before and the ultimate proof of that is the fact that there's lots and lots of gold right now that is not being used for anything at all other than it's being stored so people can claim that they own it so they can use it as collateral because that is its most valuable use case right now. 
right? As opposed to oh, Alaska, I know. I, Alaska, I just want to. I just want to jump in um, and just thank On Chain Gaming for jumping on today. Amazing that he discovered us um, and made his way to Monerotopia and the Monerotopia viewers on stage section. Um, thank you so much, man, for coming on today and talking to us. Alaska, sorry to jump in on on your on your rant there. I'll let you get back to it, but I just want to make sure I got that out before Tux closed closed it out. So thanks, On Chain Gaming. You're welcome to join the I show. I appreciate anytime. it. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for being so welcoming, guys. It's 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 this has been a really fun, engaging conversation. So I I appreciate appreciate all you guys. So the the utility of Monero could see the same thing. Right, where if there um, if there's less of a demand for transactions, then in theory it would cause the price of Monero to go down. So let me give you an example. If somebody figured out like one that a lot of people know, right? Food towers, right? If you could get a cheaper source of energy, a more effective version of glass or whatever, I mean, one tiny little change in the engineering of our food infrastructure could lead to a massive crash in the money velocity generally and so let's say you're in a situation where money is entirely measured in monero and people are only using monero and it's already got you know it's just running tail emission right now so it's not like a lot is ever entering the supply it's already hit an equilibrium well the thing is is if everybody's buying their food in monero and there's this massive collapse in the demand for purchasing food because communities are all building their own food towers and then you just go to the local food tower pick up your vegetables and all that stuff. All of a sudden now pig feed is virtually zero because you have an infinite supply of vegetables and so on. So you can feed your chickens and your pigs and all that for next to free. Now everybody's got their own chickens. Well, like 10% of all money velocity is food related, right? So that's a 10% reduction in money velocity. That'd probably result in like a 7% reduction in the value of Monero as a currency, right? But that doesn't mean that if you're holding a bunch of bags of Monero, all of a sudden you are like 7% less rich. Because the thing is, is that that money goes way further now. It buys way more stuff than it ever did before. So you're actually significantly richer, even though your bags are not as pumped as they were. And that's one of the things that, uh, I mean, it, it like it, it makes me want to just rip my face off. If you're like listening to somebody like Peter Schiff talk about you, Gold is up $400 over such and such time. And that means if you would have done this and that and whatever, the same guy who's arguing that the dollar is collapsing and the same guy that's arguing that fiat is collapsing and so on. And then his next argument, his very next argument is the fact that it derives its value from the fact that you can use gold for all of these things because of its physical properties. And that's what gives it its value. Even though only it's like almost 99.9% .9 used to put in a vault or put in somebody's safe, it is never used for anything other than collateralization financially because of its price, right? And it's so if you're it, you it, so the thing is you can believe each argument, but it is incredibly intellectually dishonest to believe each argument at the same time. Now, most people just have never thought it through. Right. But the thing is, is if you're going to make an argument for utility and then you're going to make an argument for supply and then you're going to make an argument for what it can buy being the currency. Well, all three of those things are happening simultaneously if you believe that they're true. Therefore, the price of Monero or gold or whatever could literally never reach zero because there is always going to be an input cost and the, the use case of everything goes up with its availability. Right. So the thing is, is economies of scale, your margins always go down when you can produce more widgets because people start buying more widgets because the price goes down. So you're making more money. So you invest in being able to make more widgets. And the next thing you know, you're making two percent per widget, but you used to make 100 and now you make 100 million. And the demand is so astronomically high that the economy of being in the widget business has never been better. And yet a startup trying to make widgets is looking at like a 2% margin, whereas the person who blazed the trail was originally talking about like a thousand percent margin. 